Okay. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm joined with a very special guest. This is Isaiah Diesel at RG Podcast. Though Mr. Warnick just called me Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel is, uh, just think of me, just a, a smaller version of me. He's like my mini me. And yeah, then you get me. So how are you doing today, Mr. Warnick? Good. I'm sorry. I'm a couple minutes late. I'm uh, no, no problem. I just was trying to get here. I move a little slower than I used to. I totally get that. Um, my knee starting to go out on me. So um, well, it's been going out for the last year or so. So uh, I totally get that. So uh, can you tell me real quick where you're calling out of? Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte. All right. That's like the home of Michael Jordan, right? He's no, from a small town in North Carolina. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thank Not you for uh, thank you for giving us him. And um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much. Really, 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 really appreciate you coming on today. The Respect, yeah. Humility, Empathy podcast. Uh, looking forward to a nice, civil, friendly talk. And so before we do that, we just like to ask you a few friendly fire round questions just to set the stage of the conversation. And if you're ready for that, are you ready for this? Let's Friendly go. Fire? Okay, so what, <laughs> what action hero would you want uh, as your best man, assuming you're getting uh, remarried or married again? Action figure hero? Action hero yeah. figure? Some of these questions are ridiculous, well, just so you know. I was just in a show a, a year or two ago. I was told I look like uh, Robert Downey Jr., Jr. <laughs> and Iron Man. and uh, All right, Christopher. all right. Someone made right. up a um, an image of my head on Iron Man, so let's go with Iron Man. <laughs> okay, Iron Man. that's a great call. Okay, if you're going to colonize any planet, uh, which one would you want to colonize? Colonize a planet? Yeah. You're going to be the first explorer there. I don't know. Saturn looks cool with the rings. Saturn. There. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, how about this one? What is your favorite ice cream? Um, Rocky Road, a good old classic. Rocky. Oh, actually, that was my favorite growing up. I live here in South Korea, though. The, unfortunately, they've never heard of that. It's kind of like, I guess, a specialty in uh, mm. in America. All right. So here we go. Top three 70s bands of all time. 70s? Um, yeah. That's, well, Led Zeppelin at the top of the list. Oh, oh good call. And, Bump on that um, one. Boom. I, I'd probably have to go with the Rolling Stones. They're probably more Stones. of a six, 60s band, but they hit their apex in the No, 80s. I think those guys started like in the 70s. 30s, man. Those yeah, guys I started think, in the 30s or the 20s. Uh, I think, they've I been think going they're around. each 100 years old. Um, <laughs> well, they've been around for 100 years, so they, they they must have been a little bit older when they got started. So so 70s, I think I'm, I'm going to have to throw Journey in there, although they probably may – some may, people may think of them as an 80s band. but Yeah, see, I, I think of them as an 80s band, but – they probably did get started in the 70s. But uh, all right, then let's let just run with that one then because uh, I'm more of an 80s guy myself. So top three 80s. Well, um, I, I hate the 80s music. I hate it. You know, you got people like Duran Duran. I mean, that's just. Oh, come on. That is literally my favorite. <laughs> come on. That is my favorite. I just poked you. I did that on purpose. Yeah, we're I, off on a really bad start I, here. I saw I you share that. that that was your. Um, <laughs> I, I don't even know that I could name three '80s bands, so you just tell me your three, and we'll go with that. <laughs> All right. Well, Duran Duran, they're my number one. Uh, number two would have to be The Cure, and a close third is going to be The Smith. So yeah, we got the, the okay. big three right there. All right, and then this is going to be the most important question you've ever been asked in your entire life. So uh, be sure you answer wisely. Okay. Got it. All right. So if you were a charge of the CIA torture department and you had to crack a terrorist or someone, some nefarious character, and you had to play a song on loop to torture them, what song would you use to torture them? That's easy. Sweet Caroline. Sweet Caroline. Who sings that? Neil Diamond. Okay, Neil Diamond. All right, here we go. So real quick, um, I wonder if you can give me a one minute, just real quick summary, uh, very basic about your spiritual journey, where you were, where you started, where you are right now. And, uh, and then we'll start to unpack it a little yeah. bit more, please. I, Thank you. I was um, a Jesus freak in the 70s. I, came, I became a born-again Christian and spirit-filled Christian in the, in the 70s and wow. loved the bulk of my um, adult life as a charismatic evangelical. 
And about a dozen years ago, I began to unpack that and uh, uh, deconstruct that as the buzzword is now. Mm -hmm. And when I deconstructed it, as you would a house that needs to be rebuilt, I found out that there wasn't any substance there. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any foundation to which to build a new house on. And so I uh, let go of faith completely. Um, or somewhere around 2011, 2012, and I now identify as an atheist. Okay. So that's that's the long and short of it. All right, and just real quick, um, and you you said Pentecostal, so would you, or um, you said like charismatic, uh, yeah. you, you were like a Pentecostal? Yeah, the, the markings of a Pentecostal in that I spoke in tongues and believed in the gifts of healing and prophecy and miracles and uh the words of wisdom and knowledge and prophetic utterances and things like that so yeah i i, I didn't i wasn't a classic pentecostal as in a, one of the pentecostal denominations but i looked and smelled and sounded like a pentecostal we call yeah. ourselves charismatic evangelicals charismatic. right right yeah you know i i grew up in a minister's home um my dad's a minister and um mm -hmm. we are non-denominational charismatic so yeah that's kind of where growing, i was yeah growing up seeing some of that stuff uh makes you really super s suspicious because it, it seems like there's a lot of superstitious stuff they're always talking about the devil and demons and the world ending and stuff yeah like growing up you maybe you remember this but they they, they came out with this pamphlet that said 88 reasons why the world was going to end in 1988 yeah and so then that didn't happen. And then you're like, well, you know, what exactly is, you know, where exactly does, does this come from? And because obviously this is for man. And my cousin, who's an atheist now, he, he, he was attending church with us back then. And he told, he told me as an adult that that was like, a, that was kind of a last straw for him. He's like, they say the world's going to end and then it doesn't end. And then... You know, you're kind of left in a bag of empty bag of taters. And then you're just like, well, you know, we're putting our bags in this. We're putting our taters in this bag and then it doesn't happen. So and then ironically, though, that like the Bible says, like, we're not going to know what time God's going to come back. And then people are claiming that they know. So it just totally destroys their credibility. Right. But yeah, uh, it does. But they don't seem to they don't seem to stop doing it. The people who keep predicting right. the return of Jesus keep just moving the goalposts. I mean, when I was a Jesus freak in the early 70s, there was a book by Hal Lindsey called The Late Great Planet Earth. And it was identifying that we were in the last generation and that Jesus was going to come in our generation. People have been saying that for generations. And right. that that pamphlet was actually a book. And I was on staff at a church as a pastor when that book came out in uh, the mid eighties and uh, several of my church members really latched onto that. And I had to, I had to talk, talk them down and say, no, 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 yeah, you, can't, you, you, you can't, you can't rely on something like that. And sure enough, yeah. if Jesus came back, he came back really quietly. <laughs> well, I just, Jesus said he himself didn't know when he would, uh, when the father would be coming back. So I'm like, I, I, analyzing this objectively, I'm like, well, apparently you're smarter than Jesus. I should probably be uh, serving you yeah, because you apparently have information Jesus doesn't. So I don't really get caught up on that. And that guy, Hal Lindsey, he's a little out there. If anybody doesn't know who that guy is, uh, thank God you don't know who he is because that guy, that guy's definitely out there. But, mm -hmm. okay, really quick, uh, did you get a chance to look over the questions I sent you? Yeah, yeah, briefly, so we can uh, we can touch on them if you want. Yeah, we have to jump right into here because okay. I I do have a class. Um, we had to arrange your time a little bit differently, so uh, sure. I, I do have a class that I, I need to teach you. I only have a little bit over an hour, but okay. What's the number one thing that you have learned or thought about after getting your diagnosis? And if you could just run through quick what your diagnosis, yeah, is, and um, what thing you've learned or thought about after that fact yeah als amyotrophic lateral sclerosis commonly known as lou gehrig's disease it's a uh, a terminal disease with no treatment and no cure it's a motor neuron disease it affects the body in a way that the uh, brain quits communicating with the muscles that or the nerves 
the brain sends signals to the nerves and the nerves tell the muscles what to do. Um, and the voluntary muscles like grabbing something and picking something up and walking mm -hmm. and chewing food. And so the nerves quit, quit communicating with the muscles and the muscles atrophy and eventually uh, paralyze. And then you lose the ability to walk and do things with your hands and eventually lose the ability to breathe. And that's how you die. Oh, so I was going to Go I was going to ask you how exactly does the death come about by that? But yeah. wow, it's wow. The diaphragm, the diaphragm, which controls your breathing, quits working, and then you suffocate. Um, it's a hundred percent fatal disease. Uh, you, you're given three to five years from diagnosis to live, and the about fifty percent of the people die in two years, and then there are people who live mm. eight, eight to ten to twelve years, and some longer. But it's I'm I'm a slower progressing form. Um, than a lot of them. And I've learned that after I got it. But the number one thing I've learned uh, after getting diagnosis is how precious and brief this one life is that we know we have. Whoa. This is, we have this life and we know this is the one we have. We don't, as an evangelical Christian, I always believed that there was an afterlife either in heaven or, or hell, depending on how you believe about Jesus. Well, I let go of that idea when I became an atheist and I was living with the idea that this is the one life we have. And then when I got diagnosed with ALS, I really put the hammer down and uh, mashed the accelerator, if you will, and said, I need to really get busy living this life and making the most of it and grabbing the moments. So that's what I started the Dying Out Loud project about a little over three years ago. And because, uh, because of the diagnosis. I, I do want to get to that in a second. But um, do, are you are you a bit of a are you a bit of a country fan? No, not at all. I'm from Nashville, okay. Tennessee, but I hate—I don't like country uh, music. That's irony, man. I, what yeah, you, I uh, yeah, what, what a what a tragedy. Actually, I grew up listening to country because my mom was like obsessed with it. But uh, so I had country is you know country is one of those genres that if you don't like it and you have to listen to it, you will like put a bullet in your head. So it's like yeah. as a part of the just. Um, adjusting and staying sane how to start liking country but anyway right. there's a country singer named um tim mcgraw are, are you familiar oh, yeah. with tim mcgraw yeah so he, I, I've he actually has met a, him. really wow yeah so then you're probably familiar with the song that he has uh, like you were dying yeah okay yeah yeah that was one of his I, big hits yeah that's that's the that's that's the idea you know go 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 ride on a bull named cat uh katmandu and jump out of an airplane <laughs> and i've done that i, I did went really? skydiving and yeah we helicoptered over the grand canyon i jumped out of an airplane and whoa um and so we've you know i'm I'm looking for those experiences that can make you feel alive um and so that's kind of a thing that i've kind of focused on I, and traveling and doing things like that but more so wow. i've focused on the dying out loud work that i do and traveling and yeah. speaking and doing podcasts and YouTube shows and things like that. I don't want to touch on that topic yet. So we'll get back to that. Sure. Uh, the, 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 because I just want to focus right now um, yeah. uh, on that. I mean, I know it's a part of it. It's related, but I want yeah, to say no, it no worries. But um, okay. So yeah. So that song very similar because he's given a diagnosis and mm -hmm. I think Probably the best thing I like about country is that it's the only genre that actively tells entire stories. Yeah, in, it's a in, great storytelling genre. Uh -huh. Right. I, I would say really the only one. Um, you might have a rap song or an R&B song that occasionally might tell a story. But in, in country, it is actively telling entire stories and songs. And so yeah. he, he's this guy is not dying he he's singing a song about meeting a guy who's dying and the mm -hmm. guy tells him i hope you get the chance to mm -hmm. live like you're dying because i think everybody knows it in the back of our minds that we're going to die someday but if you were to really analyze your behavior it doesn't seem like a lot of the things that we're doing is consistent with knowing that either we're going to die or the people we love are going to die one day even just take for example like uh like a father to a child a father might be really wrapped up in their career or whatever else they got going on maybe relationship and then maybe they might lose a child or find out that they're uh, going to be dying one day and i think that would totally make them reevaluate their priorities and how they're spending their time and such time and money etc 
right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. have you, have you got a chance to really like reevaluate priorities and direction? Yeah, in essence, that's what I do talk about when I do talk. It's it's how we can get lost in the moments and can get caught up in the trivial things in life and mm -hmm. lose focus on what really matters. Uh, early on in the process, we were in a meeting, uh, an ex-Christian atheist group in Nashville that I'm a part of, and they were processing my diagnosis. And there was a lady mm -hmm. there who said, I, I really had to catch myself this week because th they had just learned of my diagnosis that week. And so the group was processing. It was very emotional. And I write about this in my book. And um, and, and she said, I, I was getting frustrated with the uh, with just the details of life and I, I stopped myself and I thought Dave wouldn't be worried about these little trivial things right. you know he's dealing with a really big thing and she said you know uh, I, I I need to I need to think about these things like Dave would and someone across the room said yeah what would Dave do WWDD and, <laughs> and, and, and then someone else <laughs> said WWDD let's make bracelets so we actually did and we oh, yeah, oh, oh my god well hold on hold on we, this is we this have is too bracelets much... for sale on hold our on. merch store on my website <laughs> this is too much sacrilege for a christian year so i think i'm about to end this podcast right about yeah. now man no i'm just, well, I'm at just least, kidding at least i'm real right so you know, yeah. we know we know that i'm here we don't know that wwd <laughs> is here touche touche yeah uh okay any chance you've ever heard of um a youtube channel called scrubs and grumpy um it's this yeah. guy who's yeah he's bound he's bound to a wheelchair my and wife he has, listens to them regular my wife listens to them passionately they're uh he's, they're, they're they've got a huge youtube following yeah they do people. like a million people and his wife is like a supermodel like, like right yeah, yeah. she's a, and she takes care of him and yeah and and, and i'll tell you this from what but like, so like on the service level, you would think like, I, <laughs> I couldn't grab a woman like that. You know what I mean? And I'm like able-bodied. I'm a, uh, I'm a relatively intelligent, but I couldn't, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't pull it off. And this guy pulled it off. But one of the things that, um, one of the things I, I've learned about their story, because I follow them a lot, is that he has been bad. So it's not like you where you get it later on he's like yeah. from a child he yeah. he's had this diagnosis and he can't do right. a lot of things for himself and so she wound up found, finding him online and i think just meeting him and seeing his outlook on life and the fact that he's never let this diagnosis like get him down because i i, I really do think dave that um you could like you can change perspective on things and and the same event, like there's no universal response to an event. You could have the same event happen. And if you just think about it in a slightly different way, it could be the difference between night and day. So I, I do want to ask you real quick. Have you have you have you felt a, a, a tendency to like get in the gutter? Like are there days you just wake up and you're like, why am I doing this? Like or how um, do you overcome that? I I have had bad moments, rough moments. Mm -hmm. My partner and I, oh, speaking, you know, his, his wife is, is a, a supermodel. Look, yeah. you, you should see my partner. I got lucky too. <laughs> and everybody wonders, what is she doing with him? Um, but we do have times when it, when that was it becomes, really clever. That's really yeah. good. I got to give you props on that. Husband, yeah, husband, like that. that's clever. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I'm overall a very positive guy. And I must say that those moments of, in the gutter as you speak as you said are not that often and they and when they do hit me they're very brief usually it will be like um something i'm trying to do with my 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 symptoms are mostly in my hands and arms and um and and i'm trying to do something with them and i can't get it done and i get frustrated and i get mm -hmm. god damn it I, i'm not supposed to cuss on your channel but okay, i'll sorry. get frustrated and um I, i'm going to make an exception for you if you want to say god damn it because uh i if there is a god i could totally understand that, like uh you, you might be thinking why me so yeah you, you get you get a free pass i get a pass okay. you gotta get a pass just don't abuse it but yeah but i don't abuse it, like, don't abuse it. like the other day i am starting to have trouble with my legs a little bit i'm still able to walk but they're getting weaker and the other day i was trying to do something and i was stepping across a little ditch and i just oh. I, I didn't hit it just right and i actually literally did fall down in the gutter 
Oh, um, oh God, I'm sorry. So that, that. that was frustrating in a sense. It didn't hurt myself. I did have a little bit of a mild concussion for a minute, but I oh. didn't, I didn't hurt myself badly, but just the reality of falling down and not, not being able to jump back up. I kind of have to move around and then push myself up to my knees mm -hmm. and then, and then kind of stagger up from there. That that's a real uh, difficult emotional um, hurdle, if you will, to, to have to face up to and realize this thing is really coming for me. Right. And so those are the moments coming that are, for me. Those are the moments that are hard. Uh, most of most of the day, I'm very positive and upbeat and forward thinking, but I do have my moments. Yeah. Yeah, actually. So that's number two. That'll go into right into number two. But what is the hardest thing about living with your ailment? That's kind of it. I kind of already answered that. Just the challenges of physical uh, mobility and functionality yeah. and the decreasing availability of that. My muscles are fading away and uh, part two of that is the realization that the people that care about me the most are going to be the ones that suffer the most from me passing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to sleep and not wake up. It's not a big deal for me, but I'm going to go to sleep and then they're going to wake up the next day and I won't be there. And um, I, I know I have a lot of people in my life that care a great deal about me. And uh, I, I love this little clip I saw once uh, Stephen Colbert was asking um, uh, what's the guy in the Matrix? I, can't, uh, uh, I just blanked on his name real quick. Uh, Keanu uh, Reeves. Keanu Reeves. Yeah. I was, was going to ask you that. Does your mind? Does your mind slip at all? No, no, that's not an A-list okay. thing. That's just okay. an old man thing. Um, okay. <laughs> but yes, I think he was trying to do a gotcha thing on Keanu Reeves, and he says, "What do you think happens when we die, Keanu?" And Keanu pauses and he looks very thoughtful for a minute, and then he just says very simply, "I know." that the ones who love us will miss us. That was so profound. We get caught up in thinking about what happens to me after I die. That's not the question. It's what happens to those around me after I die that I leave behind. That's mm. the tougher question. He he has a really tragic story. Um, I believe like his fiance, his fiance um, had died. And um, mm, I didn't know that. I, I believe... He has some kind of story like that, that really, um, he really had to confront tragedy. It's either with, the, I don't know off the top of my head and I don't want to butcher it because mm -hmm. he's known amongst celebrities as being like an exception to, to the rule. Because yeah. now, especially right now in this Amber, her, Johnny Depp thing, yeah, you're getting to see a little bit behind the scenes that, yeah, I see this guy on TV and... The guy is really good looking, but this is probably not a life I'd want to swap with yeah. this guy. I probably There's wouldn't want to swap. Stuff. There's a lot of stuff right. behind the scenes that we don't see. Yeah. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is really sad. I might get a little bit emotional discussing this, but I know Keanu Reeves has been really out of his way, like on set to treat everybody with dignity and respect. You know, to me, mm -hmm. that's a sign of a character of person. Whenever you treat people with dignity and respect that you don't have to, you know, Absolutely. Uh, everyone's gonna everyone's gonna teach uh, treat their boss or CEO or um, uh, a politician or whatever with respect, but he's known as going out of his way to be accommodating and like I think I think one of his movies I believe it's John Wick don't quote me, but he bought like all of his stunt double guys like Rolexes or something like that, yeah and um, so he goes like you don't have to do that you know what I mean you don't have to do that you're the you're, you're the guy on set. I actually used to be a really big fan of Christian Bale. Um, he was one of my favorite actors. But there's this tape got leaked of um, him cussing out like this guy who accidentally walked behind him while he's filming. He walked in front of him. And he just lost it. He lost his shit, man. He went ape shit, totally. Cussing. I mean, he went. Yeah, he demanded that. that the guy got fired. Yeah, the audio wow. leaked of it. So. But anyway, uh, Keanu Reeves, um, I think dealing with that tragedy um, that he had helped center him in a way that... Uh, yeah, it has to. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, that being said, uh, I think we have enough for that question. But, okay, this is uh, this might get a little bit contentious right here. Okay, you ready for this one? Woohoo! 
I provide these questions, so I, I'm not like, like trying to um, straw man or like push you into right. a corner or whatever, you know, uh, because yeah. these are really sincere, honest questions I'm asking you that uh, they're not gotcha questions, but has finding out that you're dying uh, made you question or second guess your atheism? No, that's not a hard question at all um, or contentious. I've been asked that actually quite a bit in my Q&A and at meetings and uh, on shows. But uh, no, I, I mean, when I came to the conclusion of my faith and or the end of my faith and came to the conclusion that God wasn't there and never had been, I, uh, there was no part of me that was like clinging to that. It was sad to realize I had given my life to something that I had come to the conclusion wasn't true. But I, I didn't think, oh, no, what am I going to do now without God? I, I, I just kind of said, OK, then let's get on with my life. And what's that going to look like? And so that's I hate Kim Possible. She's a loyal fan. Um so no, it hasn't, uh, getting diagnosed with a terminal illness, and they say there are no atheists in foxholes, which is not true at all. Uh, there, there, no, there's no atheists. There's no, foxhole. there's no atheist skydivers, let's just say that. You had mentioned skydiving. There's no yeah. atheist. That, that's a fact. That's a, that's a statistically proven fact. No, I'm just kidding. No, Sorry. <laughs> I, I was an atheist. I'm that's an atheist, and I was a skydiver. It's um, a joke. Come on. You got to take it. I know. I'm just, I'm, I'm going with you. But no, I, I don't have any second guessing of, and I didn't go, oh, okay, this is bad. I'm just kidding about that atheism, God. Let's talk. You know, I, it, I, atheism wasn't a choice. That's the thing a lot of people misunderstand. Right. No, no, no. I atheism agree with you. is not something you choose. It's a conclusion you come to. So, yeah, I just realized, okay, this is me. I got diagnosed with ALS, and these are the cards I've been dealt, and now i got to make the most of it. In to, fact, to me, I, I, would, I don't know. I might. Well, an addendum to that question, a, a, a part two of that, people have asked me, what do you think your reaction would have been if you'd have gotten diagnosed with ALS as a Christian? And I always say, I've thought about this a lot. I think it would have been much well, more difficult. It would have been much more difficult because when you're a Christian, at least the brand I was, where you believe that the God you serve was active and involved and answered prayers, mm -hmm. you've got to factor God into everything that happens. You got to say, okay, where's God in this? What's God doing? What's God's will? Did I sin? Did I not pray enough? Do I have not? A, don't have enough faith? Do I not believe enough? All these questions mm -hmm. are bouncing around in your head because you've got to factor God into the events that you're experiencing. Well, as an atheist, you don't. It's just life. Yeah. Life happens. Shitty things happen to good people and bad people. Atheists and Christians. This just happened to be something that happened to me. It's really that it simple. Is this a genetic thing? Like, uh, does it no. run in your family? Okay. Do you, so did you just catch it? Like, it's like a disease you yeah. can get? No one knows. It's a, it's a really? mysterious. Okay. There's a lot of work being done trying to identify what causes it. What, you know, how, a lot of stuff have been going on for years and nobody can figure it out. So, okay. Okay. So, wow. There's so many things I want to ask you. We have such a little time right now. But yeah. okay. Okay. So. Uh, first of all, I agree with you. It's like, so for me as a Christian, it makes zero sense for me to try to abuse you or even to be honest, to try to convert you. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. To me, I don't try to preach uh, to the atheists or people from this channel. It's like I try to do my part as far as being a light and being compassionate and, and caring and treating people with respect. Because, you know, there's there's a lot of Christians online who don't do that to, to atheists. So, I mean, I right. was an atheist myself for like a decade. So... Uh, and I had an experience with Jesus Christ. So I literally would sit in a church and I would be like praying to God. Like I would see people worshiping and jumping and dancing and crying and stuff and singing. I'm like, I don't know what the hell they're celebrating because I don't know what any of this means. Mm -hmm. I could have quoted every lyric forward and backwards to every song I heard and it didn't make, I, I literally didn't understand like 1% of what it was. So whenever I did find Jesus at the age of 32, I remember going back and listening to those songs and just crying my eyes out because I understood the lyrics for the first time in my life. But I felt like, I felt like there was a pressure on me from my parents because they were ministers. They wanted me to be a minister myself. They forced me to go to Bible college, but I just, it didn't believe, you know? So that's kind of like what my feeling is like, it, it's either you believe this or you don't believe it. it's like 
Um, you're mm -hmm. either convinced of something or you don't convinced of it. I just have to say, though, if I were in your shoes, maybe I'm a weaker person than you because I can imagine I would be like at least entertaining it a lot more, especially if you're on like your deathbed. I remember whenever Richard, no, uh, not Richard, uh, Hitchens, whenever Hitchens died. Hitch, Hitchens, right. Yeah, whenever he died, he said, I want people by my side um, whenever I die because I don't want any stories coming out that right. I had some kind of last minute uh, conversion. And I'm like, dude, you you have you have gonads the size of, of a no, grapefruit. No, I mean, you say you, you would maybe reconsider. What's, what is uh -huh. there to reconsider? I mean... I, I came, I, I knew all of the ins and outs of faith. I was a pastor. I preached it. I taught it. I knew the Bible backwards and forwards. I had what I thought was experiences with God, but now I look back and realize those were just neurological uh, events in my brain that I thought was an experience with God. Or, But I mean, when you say I, you'd be tempted to reconsider, what is there to reconsider? I don't see anything there to reconsider. Well, because... Dave, you do realize something that you do not know 99.9% .9 of what there is to know in the universe, right? No, you would I'm agree. open you to could... any chance that comes okay. along, absolutely. So, 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 so if you understand that you know just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percentage and the information that maybe you were presented with, maybe you misinterpreted it uh, wrongly or whatever. I'm just, I'm just hypothetically throwing, mm -hmm. just throwing this out there. Um, but I would second guess, I would, I would absolutely do it. And I will say this just unrelated, but it is related, but I almost died about two years ago myself. And, um, uh, as a Christian, I was, it was in a 24 hour period, I would experience more pain than I had in, in 37 years of my life. Literally. I mean, it was to the point where, um, I couldn't stand, I couldn't walk. And I had to crawl on the, the floor like a baby, like literally. And when I mean crawl, I mean, I had to take steps like this with my hands. I mean, I couldn't even like all my joints were, I totally imagine it would be like what you've experienced because my arm started bending in like all the joints. And, um, and I literally thought I was going to die. Mm -hmm. And, and I can't imagine honestly going through that uh, as an unbeliever because, um, uh, my faith was like one thing that I latched onto that like, there has to be some kind of reason for this. Even if I die, I'm like, even if I die serving God and not giving up on my faith till the end, I'm like, if that's what I have to do uh, to well, show my faith. Why does there have to be some reason for this? I mean, like I said, things just happen. I, yeah. I There's no reason I got ALS. Um, I, there are a certain number of people every year that get diagnosed with it statistically. Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. one that did. So when you say there has to be a reason for this and there has to be some, you, you found comfort in a faith that was there with you. But what was that faith doing for you? You could have gotten just as much from a, a, a nice blanket as far as yeah. having comfort for you. But, but OK, so I, I totally get that this probably works for you, that this way of thinking. And I mm -hmm. all completely admit that you're maybe just a much stronger person than I am, because uh, I would in my own personal um, evaluation, I would rather believe a lie in that situation. I would rather believe that oh, to get comfort, okay. a placebo. So if, if you're if you're someone who says I'll be, I'm more comforted with brutal realities uh, of that. Yeah, I just say I'd you're just a stronger person than me. True. Yeah, yeah, you're a stronger person than me. Um, I don't know if that's so, true. I just I've made up my mind that I only want to believe things that are true. I don't sure. want to believe things just because they make me feel better. And I think a lot of mm -hmm. I, I'm just going to say I think a lot of Christians have that. So somewhere in the back of their mind, they just want to see grandma again, or they want to see their spouse again. So I'm or their dogs, up, sometimes yeah, dogs. I'm going to hang under the notion that there's a God that's going to usher me into heaven when I die. There's no evidence whatsoever for that. Um, there's no evidence that there's a God. So when I, when I, when you say there's a lot of things that I don't know, I would be the first to agree with that. I, I'm, but I'm perfectly willing to say I don't know. Those can be right. the three, three, three strongest words we can say. Rather, I than agree make, with that rather than make up an answer that's not true. And so I, I'm open to the evidence. God, I mean, right. if God wants to come and show himself to me, I'm right here. I, I, I'm wide open. I've got an open mind. Yeah. I've got the most open mind I've ever had in my life. But so far he hasn't. Or she in my life. Um, I like that you said in my life, 
this in guy over. Oh, I'm sorry, seven. this guy, this gal over here, monkey for bananas. I love talking to her because whenever we're talking, she has the southern draw. She's like, ma, ma, ah, yeah. ma, ah, all my life, <laughs> my life. I can I get, get way on down there. I can get more country if you want. I can get way down there country for you now if you want to. Uh, do you know what you get when you play country music backwards, by the way? I don't know. You get sober. Uh, you get your wife back. Get your truck back. <laughs> get joke. your dog back. Um, yeah. You know what? Um, I don't I, I don't really want to push this issue because um, oh, this fine. is just no, a no, matter no. of my own personal yeah, no, uh, cool. experience. I mean, I've experienced I've experienced things. <laughs> She's putting, uh, she's putting some happy faces, faces here. Yeah. But uh, actually, I'm very looking forward to having her on the conversation because she's in the process of, uh, of a transition right now. So maybe coming on this channel will cool. be uh, her coming out. I don't want to say the closet, but uh, talking about the transition. And so right. I want to share that story um, going to that. But um, but I do want, I, I, I will say this. Uh, because you said that there's no evidence. What you should say is that I haven't seen any evidence because, again, if you don't know 99.9%. Yeah, hold on, let me finish. Let me finish. Yeah. What I talk about this, just this channel is like why I like to have conversations and discuss things with people from all walks of life, is that I give an analogy. Like if you walked into a movie and you had like a little straw, like I don't have a straw here, but let's just say this is a straw and you're looking through the straw and you sit in the back and you look at like the corner of the, the opening credits and then that's all you get to see. And then you walk out and you're like, oh, that movie sucked. And then, but when you process this, you saw one glimpse of one corner for a second yeah. in the back of the row. And so we're all having different parts of like, uh, like it's like a never ending story that's going on. And we're all taking different screenshots or, uh, images of what we're seeing in our lives. So um, I don't know what other people have experienced. That's why as a Christian, I don't say like, oh, as a Muslim or a Hindu, like you can't experience anything or I don't know what someone else's experience. So I don't talk about anyone else's experiences. I can talk about my experiences, my experience with God uh, being an atheist before and being a Christian now, but uh, I wouldn't try to discredit uh, anyone from another faith or try to say that their experiences aren't valid, you know? Um, you know what well, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I guess you're saying that you had an experience of some kind, and you attribute that to the God that you believed or that you were taught is the real God, whereas someone else around the some other part of the world could have a similar experience, yeah, and attribute that to their God. So mm -hmm. what you're saying is that all these gods are valid, and that there's no one that's more true than the other. That's not what I said. No, I did not say that. I said yeah. I don't know. I said, I don't know. I didn't say that their experience is valid. I said, I don't know what the experience. It could or could not be valid. I'm saying I wouldn't try to disprove them. Right. Okay. So, yeah. That yeah, might I, give I, me don't, I don't try to disprove anyone either. Um, I'm just saying that, I, like you said, I haven't seen compelling enough sure, evidence sure. to place my faith in a God who makes a claim to my life. And so that's, sure. that's kind of where I'm at. And just real quick, I want to ask you this real quick. How many years totally were you a minister? I was a Christian about 38 years, uh, and uh, about half of those years I was uh, on staff at a, at a church as, an, as a pastor. The other, the other year, those years I was in business for myself or doing other kind of work, but I was always involved in, in leadership do, in the church. Do you remember the last sermon that you ever gave? No. You don't? Okay. But... Do you remember the last time? Do you, Do you remember the last time you went to church and then like just the feeling of never going back, or is that no, too long ago? No, it's kind of funny. I I never made a big like I'm not going to church anymore and made a big announcement. I just kind of drifted away. It just became as my faith was disintegrating. I just realized why am I gonna why Why would I go to church anymore? And so it was just kind of one of those things where I just um one day I instead of going I didn't go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and no, that makes. Back. Wasn't a Dillahante, was he a minister himself as well? No, no, he was in Bible school. He never, never did. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I've actually always wanted to interview a former pastor. Uh, unfortunately, because we had to put back the time, I don't have, I can't get nearly as deep with this. Maybe we'll just have to schedule around two. 
um, because the time uh, we had to bump it sure. back. So I do have class uh, in about 30 minutes. So I am going to try to blow through these. Uh, I do want to say I really thank you for your time. Sure. Um, this is a fascinating conversation. Um, so we'll come up to, I do want you to get to talk to you about your, uh, your dying, that work you're doing with that. Yeah, and then also talk, talk a little bit about your book mm -hmm. and if we can, um, give away maybe three copies of that, uh, people can hashtag you or hashtag your book and then we'll choose three winners, uh, from the comment section because, okay. uh, hopefully it can help someone out there. I think these kind of stories inspirational and they can, uh, they can help people, but, uh, here we go. This is an interesting one. Any chance you've ever read Tuesdays with Maury? Yeah, twice. Okay, I think I've read it twice, two or three times myself. Mm -hmm. So just to get a real quick uh, recap, uh, professors died in there, guy's professor. And every Tuesday he gets together with a former student and he tells a story and he gives all of this life knowledge. And interesting, this is just side thing because he talks in there about everybody knows that we're dying, but nobody actually like properly lives that out until you actually find out you have a finite amount of time. I think mm -hmm. we all live secretly like we think we're going to live forever uh, on this life because I'm sure if you only knew, most people knew you had a, only a year to live, you wouldn't be doing a lot of stuff that you do. Like I saw this great meme that said, uh, life is short. You only have like a certain amount of years. Make sure you use your time arguing with random people on the internet. Like, yeah. right? like yeah. that's a good use of time. But but anyway, he talks in there about that. And one thing I thought was great was that he has the living funeral where he talks in there about, well, when you're dead, you don't get to celebrate that funeral time because you're not there. And people are saying stuff in your absence. So yeah. he had like a living funeral where people got to come and say and celebrate because you could, again, changing your perception, you could see this as a celebration, you know what I mean? Like a celebration of your life. Yeah. rather than uh, a morning of your death. Mm -hmm. So um, what are your thoughts about living funerals and would you ever have one? Yeah, I think they're, I think they're a great idea. Um, I'm, I don't have anything formally planned yet, but I have <clears> thought it through in my head, um, even, you know, music and stuff that I'd want to play. And, um, you know, I get think... Some, uh, get some country there. No, no country. A memorial service... <laughs> is one of those times when people come together and talk about you and say great things about you. And my ego is big enough that I want them to say those things about me when I'm there. So that's why I would probably say, let's do this thing while I'm still alive. <laughs> but <laughs> You own it. Can I get a bump? You're owning that. Can I get a bump? Yeah, yeah I'm owning it. I'm owning it. I can't okay. get my hand all the way up, but that's fine. Oh, um, okay, okay. You got it. No, I, uh, I think they're great in that... Also, my end is is not going to be – I'm not going to go – what did I say that cracks me up? Oh, God. You said my ego so big I want to hear it. <laughs> That's well, hilarious. Okay. I'm saying the quiet parts out loud. No, I'm, I'm so glad that you're able to speak honestly with this. I, yeah. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you flowing with some of the jokes here. Um, oh, no. But, yeah, you, you, but, that's hilarious. Um, ALS – is a series of losses. You, you lose this, you lose that. You lose like just just a month or two ago, I had to quit driving. There, there oh, are wow. things. There are things you have to give up. You, you just quit. You, you, it's a series of losses, and and I look at life as wins and losses. And when the losses add up to more than the wins, and life becomes more um difficult then then there's anything then the, then the benefit that it gives me and those around me when everything i have to do is having to be done by someone else primarily my partner um there's going to come a point where i'm going to say that's enough i'm not going to let it go to the bitter end when i suffocate and quit breathing i'm going to i'm going to come to a place where i where i draw the line and say okay I've, I've had enough. This is, I'm not going to let it go any further. I don't know where that line is and I may move it a few times, but when I can't do anything anymore, or, or I may not even wait that long. So I have the ability to decide 
what my end's going to look like and when. Now, I'm not dependent upon death with dignity laws in certain states. I have other measures I can take, so I, I could go more into detail on that or, or not. Probably. For uh, may, yeah, time, maybe I'm not. Old. That's yeah. Just I, just just I, to I, just to put it out there, I do have plans and ways to 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 you know turn the light off myself, and I'm, and and I'm so sorry. that's that's why I can have a living memorial service. And then say, okay, um, you know, next week is going to be it, uh, or something like that. So, yeah, it, just getting yeah. it really real here. Yeah, there is a total morbid curiosity about that, but I think that might not be entirely appropriate to discuss. But I will say this: that um, I am a strong proponent of euthanasia mm -hmm. um, as a Christian. Um, I remember whenever I was in high school, and they asked us about euthanasia, and I was like. Um, we had to write an essay on it. I was like, well, the youth in Asia is probably the same as the youth in Europe or America. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, pretty much. No, I'm, I'm being serious. I'm like, that's, that's, that's you not thought it, it was. Uh -huh. it's, I know, it's my first time hearing that word, but um, because I have spent a lot of time overseas and uh, spent some time in uh, Europe and a lot of places in Europe actually have, um, you know, youth in Asia uh, available as an option. And I saw, I believe it's, I believe it's Sweden, either Sweden or the Netherlands. They have like these capsules yeah. that can, you could drop it off like in the middle of the wilderness. And so you could spend your last day just gazing at the stars or wildlife or. Um, yeah. Um, and then what it does is I think it deprives, it might give you a shot or I think it just deprives it of like of CO2 or, or Maybe it puts CO2 something in it, but it, it's supposed to be like it kind of just leaves you with like a euphoric feeling. Yeah, I, I will say this. I will say this like a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was dealing with some stomach issues. And I had to go to the emergency room like four times. And I don't know what the heck they pumped me with. But man, I fell out. I, I came out of there like really euphoric. And I'm like, if I died right now, I'd be perfectly happy. So mm -hmm. I can imagine they could give you something that could leave you with a, yeah. an amazing sense. But unfortunately, I think ironically, it, it's like a lot of evangelicals are against that, oh, a lot yeah. of Christians. And I don't really understand that because I can't understand how it's supposed to be compassionate by forcing someone to continually suffer in their life. I just don't see the logical connection. It's not, it's not logical at all. It's their, right, effort right. To, it's their effort to control other people. Control. That's, evangelicals want to do that from birth to life, from from conception to life. They want to control other people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we don't die well in this country. We're we're more compassionate to our pets than we are to our people, mm -hmm. and that's unfortunate. Oh wow! Oh, he spit chills on me. We, it took me a well, while to get that one. It's it's true. Um, we don't let it. We don't let our pets suffer. Um, we put them down when their quality of life is is beyond um, what's acceptable. Because uh, we know they're suffering, and yet we we force people to suffer long past when they they're ready to go, long past when it makes any sense for anyone, and we just we have to change the way we do that. We we don't we don't we don't die well in this country at all. Yeah, you know, I'm a Christian myself, but through this podcast, we I did meet a gay atheist blogger who had a 17 year old uh, service animal. Mm -hmm. who he didn't have the funds to uh, put down. So this podcast was able to raise the, the money nice. to put his surf service animal down and then cremate it and put it in like a box and pop it in nice. the paw print and everything. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I have a probably a vastly different way of thinking than most Christians as far as yeah. uh, meeting people from the LGBT uh, plus community. We support an anti-bullying uh, campaign on here. But uh, I just try to meet people where they're at, try to love them and try to meet them. Um, I can't imagine trying to abuse people. Uh, like we, are, we already have enough things in this universe that want to kill us from asteroids to, um, you know, polar bears or Corona. Um, I don't want to contribute to a planet that's any more hostile, you know, like the universe is hostile enough uh, to us as it is. But um I do want to get onto this last question because sure. we are running out of time here. But I was wondering if you could tell me about your time with the atheist experience. Uh, I, I believe you co-host sometimes with Dilahante. Mm -hmm. And um, by the way, I really like seeing you on there. By the way, I think you're really calm and uh, collected. Yeah. Um, but 
yeah, has that helped you process or deal with things? Or has it served as maybe just a distraction? So no, I, I, I love being on the, when I started doing Dying Out Loud three and a half years ago, and, and I had a, a, a friend who served as my manager and booked me on a lot of shows like that. <laughs> and so I, I actually, the first time, the first two times I did the Atheist Experience, I actually went to Austin and did it in person. And that was the first time I'd met Matt, and we've become good friends since then. And I've done it a lot of times virtually, and now I'm a what they call a regular co-host with Matt mm -hmm. or with others, just depending on the schedule. But it, it's no, I, I it hasn't given me a different perspective. It what it has, <coughs> what it has done is allowed me to meet um, and become connected to a, a bigger audience, if you will, because they have viewers from all over the world and thousands of viewers and and so it it really connected me to a lot of people that I wouldn't have been connected to before if I hadn't been able to be on that show so much and they've become supporters of mine and followers of mine and things like that and we've I've gotten a chance to meet a lot of them in person and that that's something that's really valuable to me and it has I've also met many of them in person who've told me that that show and other shows like it. And now my show that I do every Monday night is helping people process their own journey out of faith and understanding that their deconversion is not um, unique. It's not uh, weird. You're, they're not alone. It's, it's helped them realize there's a lot of support out there. So it's been a really good asset in that way. You know what? I do want to say this, you know, Kenneth Leonard. Yeah, I know him well. Um, Kenneth Leonard, a.k.a. Uh, I call him Nurse Ratchet because he's able to engage in these really serious conversations, has this big old smile on his face. Oh, yeah. So I, 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 I yeah, yeah. I, I told you remind me of Nurse Ratchet from uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but I uh, interviewed him on the channel. But he told me something that was so interesting. It really made me, it really just stopped me in my track. But he said, he's like, he told me, he says, I've experienced faith both sides of the aisle, one as a Christian, one as a, uh, an, an, uh, an atheist. And he said, um, I believe that atheism is more comforting because when someone dies, you can't just let go of it. Whereas if they were or weren't a believer, um, that will add additional stress or worry or trauma thinking, Oh, is this person in hell? Am I going to see this person again? Yeah. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And that really stopped me in my tracks because I'm like, uh, wow, that actually yeah. kind of shakes the boat a lot because, um, you know, that's a totally different way of looking at it. I'm like, God, maybe that could be more comforting. I mean, I had mentioned if my daughter died uh, because recently, uh, I probably like a couple of days before I talked to him, I went out for a conversation. Uh, you ever had Korean uh, barbecue? Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, samgyeopsal. We do it here all the time. But um, he, I, I told him that I went out for barbecue with this guy. And like an hour into the conversation, he just dropped the bomb that is like his daughter died of brain cancer like the year before. And I told him, I was like, dude, if that happened to me, I'm like, I would rather believe a lie. I'd rather believe in if God didn't exist. I'd rather believe... Because I don't know, I don't really know how I could process my daughter passing um, as a believer. But whenever he told me that, I was like, wow, that's maybe just a really good point just to say um, you can let it go. You know, you can appreciate the time that you had with them. One, mm -hmm. another guy told me was that if you believe you're going to get to spend an eternity with someone uh, talking about like changing perspectives, then that could diminish the meaning and purpose of time that you have with them now. And so yeah. you might want to, as an atheist, might want to emphasize. Now, I would be interested to see how much people actually live that out because I'll tell you as a Christian, I don't live up to probably like half the things I profess to believe in. So I don't know how much that actually influences people. But Well, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of what I talk about in my Dying Out Loud work is, is yeah. making the most of this life we have. I have a, a saying I picked up from a poem early into my into my journey and the last line says this, we, you have, we have two lives, 
The second begins when you realize you only have one. Wow. And so we put that on a T-shirt and it's in our merch store. But in the, and in fact, that's our favorite T-shirt, our most popular T-shirt that people get. But that's that is really, really true. When you know that the time is finite, when you know that this is all there is, it does sharpen your focus in a way that's different if you think there's another chapter coming. So you're 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 more likely to make the most of 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 the moments, uh, to make the most of of the time that you do have with someone. Because the reality is whether we think there's a heaven or a hell or we don't, what we do know, all we know for sure is that we do have this life. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we got to make the most of it. That's it. Yeah. And I, I've been I've been very open about this, that I believe Christians can learn from atheists on a lot of things. I think this is one area specifically. Um, maybe the critical thinking is another area. Um, yeah. But because I, I just know a lot of Christians who like fall for anything, hook, line and sinker. And so I think using a healthy dose of skepticism uh, could be healthy to have a more well-balanced and um, mm -hmm. healthy religion. You know, I, I, I demonstrate all kinds of skepticism inside of uh, my uh, Christian yeah. Christianity because I was an atheist for uh, 10 years myself. But I think learning, learning in this sense, learning from this idea that, yeah, you're right, whether we do or we don't have that, what we have right now, we could be doing our best right now because too many, I fault too many Christians for this, that, oh, I'll pray for you or uh, it's in God's hands, whatever. It, it, it can it can really diminish people's personal responsibility on this planet. So uh, it can be really dangerous, you know? Yeah. So do you, do you personally I, believe I there's do, an afterlife? I've, ex I've, ex I've experienced a spiritual uh, realm of, uh, I've experienced a uh, divine intervention. I've experienced God materializing things in front of me. And I was not a believer. And Jesus Christ spoke to me in my room on this day, actually, 516. So uh, all that stuff, I've experienced it firsthand. So, yeah, it's more of like I have a knowledge about it. I mean, do you believe there's an heaven and a hell as biblical as, as the Bible talks about? Absolutely. Beyond any, beyond any, beyond any doubt. Beyond any doubt. I, I said... But this goes into this goes into a realm of things that I've experienced firsthand. So it's like I can't produce you like something that I can just show you that you're going to believe or anyone else would believe. But I've experienced it, so it goes from a belief into I would. But if, if there's I would a hell, who, into a realm a hell of who goes there? Who goes to hell and who goes to heaven? That is twenty thousand light years past my pay grade. Um, I will tell you this. Um, I was allowed to experience what hell would be like for two minutes. And it was the worst thing I could ever begin to describe. And as a Christian, I can't imagine God sending anybody there. So kind of a way that I, maybe, maybe just Why some kind of there then. Why did God create a place called hell? Oh, if it's hold on. Maybe just for cognitive dissonance, I have to just believe, because there are people who believe in annihilationism and probably the only thing that could, if I really thought about that every day that people would experience that I experienced. Um, I don't, I don't really think I'd be able to sleep or function. So I don't know. I just have to personally believe that. Well, I believe something that's either annihilationism or that God is able to, um, if he's mastered physics. Uh, we know something from physics is that uh, particles can um, have the ability to travel backwards. Uh, we know this from the, uh, any chance you've ever heard of the, uh, the, the, uh, it's called a, a double, it's called not like a particle eraser, like a double blind, not double blind. It's, you know, hold on, you know the classical, um, you know the classical double slit experiment where, yeah. um, wh where like they're shooting beams of light and uh, it, it depends on whether or not you're observing it, how the particles behave. No, I'm not you, familiar okay. with that. Yeah, it's, it's a little complicated, but it doesn't really make sense. Like the particle, uh, the, um, the particles at like the quantum level and they're somehow able to be in multiple places, um, uh, at, at different times. And it's only when you observe them, but the scientists try to outsmart the particles and it's called the quantum double eraser. Uh, you should, you should look it up, but well, 
I mean, I guess as I'm listening to you describe these things or your experience and understanding of God and the afterlife, uh, I mean, not to, I don't want to sound uh, sure. confrontational or unkind, not but it, it, it sounds like you've made up your own version of God and theology and afterlife and what is mm -hmm. and what isn't just to kind of suit your own, um, well, your own experience, I guess, and then uh -huh. your own desires. Like you said, you'd rather believe something that's a lie whether or not it's sure. true just because it makes you feel better i totally yeah i totally get that okay. i totally get why you uh would think that um i will say this that not everything makes total sense inside of the bible i read it and if i told you i understood 50 percent of it uh i'd be lying but um so there's there's that i don't understand all, and not all of it the stuff i do understand not all of that makes sense Mm -hmm. The stuff I do understand, maybe like 50% of that makes sense. But then again, I just say, look, I already assume, because I've had this experience with God, I already assume that his thinking is a billion times greater than mine. So maybe my concept of what I think about justice or morality, uh, maybe that doesn't even make sense in the sense of what my daughter feels towards how maybe I'm disciplining her when she doesn't want to eat her food. Maybe she thinks I'm immoral or whatever, but... She just doesn't have the, like, for instance, my daughter was starting to lose her hair because she wasn't eating properly. And so I had to start actually hitting her to like, you got to eat this food. Or we sometimes had to shove it down her, her throat and she would get really what upset you, with that. You hit hit her? Yes, because she wasn't eating. She wasn't eating uh, food. Oh, so oh, uh, okay. That's troubling. Honestly, I got to, I'm not going to, well, I, I, I kind of, I kind of can't let that pass. I mean, Okay. You should never hit a child. Um, I did. I spanked my kids when I was a Christian because I thought mm -hmm. that's what the Bible commanded us to spare the rod and spoil the child. But I look, I look at that now as really abusive, and I, I well, hope, I hope you won't do that anymore. It's, it's not. Well, okay. we'll have to agree to disagree on that. Uh, I live yeah, in South Korea, where, kids. where the teachers actually hit the kids here, or they well, used I to. Care. I, I don't care who hits them; it's okay. not good. Well, it's, we don't have the okay. kind. Of, we don't have the kind of mass shootings, uh, drug abuse. Uh, child um that's uh, you hit kids? pregnancy I mean, uh, yeah. no there's discipline they're disciplined they're we, disciplined we have here. mass shootings here because people won't pass sound gun laws and get rid of guns that's why we have mass shootings not because of unruly kids um well there's lots of other things teen pregnancies and um take the guns out of the uh lot of violence and, and drug i've had 10 of my friends murdered um, from drugs i'm not drugs um 10 of my friends murdered from guns that's what i meant to say and see, saw countless other lives ruined by uh, drugs and such. So we don't have those kind of problems here. And yeah, part well, of it, there's again, a lot again, of there's a lot of things. Yeah, there's a lot of other things going on in the world. But I, I don't think it's ever okay to hit a kid. But I'll just want to say that you do you do All you. Right. But I'm gonna I'm gonna speak up and say I don't think that's okay. Sure. Well, I appreciate your opinion, but we'll have to yeah. agree to disagree with that one. Okay. Uh, anyway, she she is eating her food now. Her hair, she was getting pretty close to me because she was starting to lose her hair because uh, she wasn't eating. Okay. The, the point, the bigger the bigger point would be that um, maybe she would think that we're being strict or unkind or whatever. But I, we knew that she was, she was under, 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 she was getting undernourished from yeah. that. So she wouldn't be able to understand that. So I th have the same kind of concepts that like, if God does exist, if me sitting around and talking about the things I find immoral or illogical doesn't really make sense. Um, I can tell you that in that other 99 point, nine percent of out there there's probably a lot of information that would change my mind on probably 90 percent of the things i believe it there's facts i can learn that i've learned facts as an adult and i look back um you know when i was 18 years old or uh, early 20s and i'm like i can't believe i used to hold those views uh, after traveling the world seeing dozens of countries it's really changed my perspective on things but i, I would do that to go right now i was wondering yeah. if you have any last thoughts apart from the discipline no, um, if you want to get my book, it's available on Amazon. It's called Childish Things, uh, because when I was a child, I put away, I thought as a child, when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's where I get the title from. That's basically a scripture from 1 Corinthians 13, but it, to me, it's my journey out of faith and waking up to maturity. Um, but it's available on Amazon. Uh, you can find the links on daveallad.org and .com, I think .org is more prevalent there but nonetheless um yeah that's it it's a great book um 
So can you, we'll hashtag that one. Um, I'll put it in the comment section. Is it called, is it called Childish Things? Yeah. Childish, Childish Things, Things, a memoir on Amazon. You can find it just by looking okay. at. So here goes one, Childish Things. Um, another one we could do is what, Dying, is it called Dying Out Loud? Dying Out Loud is my uh, organization title, Dying Out Loud. So I'm going to hashtag these. And then what is your last, uh, what is your, your full name is Dave. Is you go by Dave or David? Dave Warnock, yeah. Dave War Warnock. W-A-R-N-O-C-K. -A 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 so you can hashtag these three and uh, we'll choose one winner. Put these up. Okay. Um, childish awesome. Things, one. Um, dying Out Loud. That's another hashtag. We will choose one winner. So comment, put that in the comment section and we will be choosing three random winners. Give that away. Uh, I really want to thank you for your time, David. My Dave, pleasure. I'm sorry, Dave. Uh, I hope we could do another round. Um, I actually had a host to join me for this. Oh, yeah. You said J Mike was going to join. I don't, I know. No, no, I, no, 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 no. I thought you said J Mike. No, I, I'm sorry. trying to interview J Mike. No, no, another, another host. Gotcha. I want to interview J Mike. I had another host, but just we really messed up the times. Um, gotcha. So, uh, because he's in California, you're there. I'm, uh, yeah. And then we had to switch the time. So, uh, the time. He showed up an hour early, and uh, so oh, we had to go. Sorry. But that being yeah. said, I, I do want no, 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 not not a problem, not a problem. Just really, really grateful you're here. Um, really quick, you can find David here at Twitter, D Warnock. What's the what's the other W for? My middle name, David Wayne Warnock. <laughs> Wayne D, D W D D W W, and then we have uh, DaveOutloud.com. Yeah. So. Check that out. Yeah, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, everyone in the comment section, really appreciate it. You can check us out at uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, normally, I can have some time to sit sit around and um, chop it up afterwards. I like to talk before and after a little bit, but yeah. I, I have class starting sure. in one minute. So I'm going to leave you with this outro. And uh, David, thank you again. I really hope um, we usually have like around an hour and a half. So I really have to cut this one short. So I didn't get to ask you nearly as many questions as I wanted to ask, but uh, hopefully we could do that next time um, possible. Yeah. If you're able to join again and yeah, don't forget to like, subscribe, all that stuff. And then please share this video, hashtag it. I think, um, I think it's a ver very profound story. I think Christians and atheists can learn from the story. So that being said, I want to leave you with this and then I'm out. Mm -hmm.